So welcome to today's webinar. Today we have a really exciting um, webinar for you. The title is Using Bird Sounds to Inform the Conservation of Island Endemics. Uh, let's see, um, I'm just gonna give you a quick introduction for those of you who may not be familiar with Birds Caribbean. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we're dedicated to the conservation of Caribbean birds and their habitats throughout all the islands of the region. Um, we work with our local partners to raise awareness, to promote sound science, and to empower people and communities to um, build a region where we all appreciate and conserve and benefit from driving bird populations and ecosystems. And what's really cool in the Caribbean is that we have 171 endemic birds, which is just phenomenal. These are birds that can only be found on one or a few islands. So the Caribbean is really a birding hotspot. It's a wonderful place to visit and go birding. And right now we are celebrating those 171 endemics through our Caribbean, our annual Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival. And uh, for the last couple months, we've been celebrating endemic birds. We've had an endemic bird of the day. Um, right now the festival is wrapping up. We had bird number 29 yesterday and tomorrow we'll have bird number 30, the last bird. So I hope you've been following us and enjoying um, all of the great posts with natural history information. And, and um, we've had coloring pages for kids, um, puzzles, activity sheets, videos, bird calls, and then of course these weekly webinars that we've been doing for the last few weeks. So do be sure to look at our um, website. We have um, under resources from the nest is where we have all these endemic birds featured. And we've been also sharing on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And as we're wrapping up the festival, we have a couple of really fun things for you guys to do. Um, one of our, our, our second uh, Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival coordinator, Aliyah, has put together this awesome trivia quiz that tests you on your knowledge of the birds that we've been learning about for the last two months. So if you go to our website, um, the CEBF from the Nest, using that bit.ly link, you'll be able to see this really fun trivia quiz that she's put together. Part one was posted yesterday and part two will be posted tomorrow. So check it out and see how well you know your Caribbean birds. And we are still collecting videos. Um, we're asking people to do just a very short video saying, what does our theme this year, sing, fly, soar like a bird mean to you? Um, we just need two or three sentences max. You can talk as long as up to a minute. Um, it says the deadline is May 31st, but we will still accept videos if you haven't managed to get yours done yet. We're going to um, compile those and share them. We've been getting some really great, fun entries. So, so take a couple minutes and do that video and um, send it in to us, please. The instructions are on our website with that bit.ly link. And then a week from today, we have our last webinar in this, in this CEBF series. We've got um, Anselino Davis and Chris Johnson from the Bahamas. They'll be giving us a talk about um, Abaco Island after Hurricane Dorian. Um, Hurricane Dorian hit Abaco in 2019 and ab absolutely devastated this island and also Grand Bahama. So they are gonna be telling us about how things are on the island um, with their endemic Bahama warbler and all the cap warbler, the Bahama parrot and so forth. So um, do tune in for that webinar a week from today. It's the last one in our series. So thank you for joining us today. Happy birding and stay in touch. If you're not already getting our newsletter, please sign up. Um, we'd love for you to become a member and um, follow along with all of our activities. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing and um, Tanya is going to be presenting first for us today. Um, Tanya is the project leader for the Puerto Rican Parrot Recovery Project run by the Puerto Rican Department of Natural and Environmental Resources. Uh, she is a conservation biologist who's been helping to save the Puerto Rican Parrot since 2012. She was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico and obtained her master's degree from the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez in 2016. And she will be talking to us today about vocal evolution in the Puerto Rican Parrot. So welcome, Tanya, and um, take it away. Thank you very much, Lisa. All right, I'm gonna start with a screen share. Okay. Oh, that's not where it needs to be, okay. 
All right, my title slide. Yes, we can see it. Let's okay, see. awesome, great. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I'm gonna start off by uh, just giving you guys a brief introduction into uh, bioacoustics, which is basically what this uh, webinar is about. So bioacoustics, uh, just like the name sounds, is an uh, inter interdisciplinary study that combines uh, biology with uh, sound. So it's basically the study of the sounds that living things make, uh, why they make them, how they make them, and uh, just interactions between uh, these sounds. Um, and when we think about birds, we're obviously thinking about sounds. More, more often than not, we are uh, hearing them before we're seeing them. Uh, so uh, when you think about birds, probably the most common thing is their vocal sounds, sounds that come out of their uh, mouths and this uh, the dawn chorus, what we hear in the morning uh, when we well, first thing when we wake up. But we also have to think about uh, non-vocal sounds. And this is something that uh, Mark is going to be talking about a little uh, later also. So uh, for example, uh, a dove, uh, when they take off, a lot of doves have very uh, particular uh, wing beats. Uh, and you can uh, sometimes hear a dove, even if you don't hear it calling, you can hear it taking off. Um, and sounds are really important to birds uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, some of them you might be pretty familiar with. Uh, so for instance, a mate attraction is something I'm sure uh, most of you think about when you think about bird sounds. On the left, we have this uh, bright yellow Adelaide's warbler, which is a Puerto Rican endemic species. And they actually have uh, different song types that they will, uh, they will sing depending on whether or not they have paired up with a mate. Uh, and then there's uh, also uh, th thinking of um, non-vocal sounds, woodpeckers, uh, woodpecker drumming, uh, that sound that they make when they strike uh, surfaces with their beaks. That's also uh, believed to play a role in mate attraction. So uh, here's a really good example of just vocal and non-vocal sounds and, and how important they are for birds. Uh, here again, individual recognition uh, is another big role that uh, sounds play. So for instance, a lot of parrot species are able to distinguish between uh, their, uh, their mates and uh, other birds uh, just based on the uh, their vocalizations. And here in these green rump parrotlets, not only can they uh, distinguish between their mates and other, uh, other birds just by their calls, they can also transmit these signature calls uh, to their offspring and then they're able to distinguish between their offspring and other birds uh, by their vocalizations. Uh, sounds are also really important in territory defense. So if you're a, uh, a male and you're holding your territory, uh, presumably with lots of resources for your female, um, it might be a good idea to uh, broadcast your ownership of that territory to all your neighbors. So you sing to let your neighbors know that you are holding that territory and that way you can avoid uh, a conflict with one of your neighbors, which can be uh, very costly and lead to injury. Uh, and then there's also the importance of sound in foraging. So another parrot example, because once again, I am a parrot biologist, uh, foraging brown-throated conures. In studies of, of foraging birds, they found that birds that are foraging in groups uh, in vegetation and a group of, of conures uh, flies above them, if they call out to those birds, they are more likely to join them. So uh, songs and then calls can be used to preferentially recruit individuals to join you while you are foraging. So they can play a really big role in group dynamics. Um, to really understand sounds though and how we scientists study sounds, you really have to get a grasp on uh, the wonderful world of spectrograms. And so what is a spectrogram? Well, a spectrogram is basically a picture of sound. Uh, it's basically a graph. And on the y-axis, it's got frequency. And on the x-axis, it has time. And if you plot uh, changes in frequency over time, uh, you end up with this uh, really interesting uh, picture, sort of abstract art looking thing. And uh, just to give you guys a, a really quick example, I'm going to stop sharing screen real quick, go to a different one. So this is a really great website from the Chrome Music Lab. And you can actually, anyone can go there. Um, uh, you, you just basically Google spectrogram and, and this pops up. Um, is it on the screen now, Lisa? 
Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. So um, if you ever feel like, you know, you'd really like to make your own uh, spectrograms and you don't have any programs to do that with, you can always uh, come here and you can take a look at what it is. And uh, it gives you these options. You can record and make your own noises or you can uh, play an instrument. For instance, here's a flute. And then here is a trumpet. Oh, trombone, sorry. Okay, so one of the things I hope you'll notice is uh, the way uh, frequency ends up being represented on these uh, spectrograms is basically uh, the higher frequency, so higher pitch sounds, they're higher up on the, on the spectrogram graph. And then lower pitch sounds, you'll see them uh, a little lower. Uh, on the graph. And like, this is what bird sounds like. So yeah, look at that. You can see all these, these patterns, these pictures of what bird song sounds like. And so it's just a really uh, way to have an appreciation uh, of bird song by making your own spectrogram and just uh, taking a look at it. And because birds are uh, so particular and, and so unique in the way that they produce vocalizations, uh, scientists can actually identify a species uh, just by looking at the spectrograms. So that's one of the ways that they're used. All right, I'm gonna exit this real quick. All right, going back to the presentation. Oh, what did I do? Okay, so that's your crash course in spectrograms. You're gonna be seeing a lot of them uh, throughout my presentation and through Mark's presentation. So uh, just keep that in mind. Okay, so now that you've had your introduction uh, to how uh, sound is studied by scientists and why sound is important for birds, what are the implications uh, in conservation, of, I'm sorry, the applications of conservation uh, when we use sound? So uh, sound can be used in lots of ways in conservation. One of the most common ways in which it's used is to uh, sample and monitor a population. So uh, you can uh, install a recording device uh, in a particular habitat, and you can just leave it uh, recording. And then based on the recordings you obtain, you look at the spectrograms or you use computer software to analyze the spectrograms, and it can actually uh, tell you what different species are present there. Or if you're looking for a particular species, uh, that's one of the ways that you can uh, use sound to do that. Uh, and then there's also uh, sound and behavior changes. So uh, there's a lot of uh, behavior changes uh, that have conservation implications. And uh, sound is a really good way to study some of them. So uh, for my presentation, I'm gonna be talking about the Puerto Rican Amazon, that's a species I study. And what we're talking about their vocal behavior. Um, so the, uh, the Puerto Rican parrot is a species that it's critically endangered and it's part of uh, a really uh, long-term captive breeding and release program. Uh, you can see one of our uh, chicks hatching out of an egg there. Uh, and then uh, captive breeding is a very useful tool, uh, but it also has its drawbacks. And one of the uh, biggest drawbacks is the fact that it can cause changes in behavior. Uh, so here's a, a really good example of uh, changes in cultural behaviors. And cultural behaviors are behaviors that are passed on uh, from one member of a species to another. So, so they're learned from other conspecifics, they're not innate behaviors. And those types of uh, behaviors can be particularly prone to getting lost in captivity. Uh, for instance, this example of these endangered cranes, they have to be, uh, they're, they're migratory and they have to be taught their migration routes uh, by following fixed wing aircrafts because they, um, it, uh, migratory routes are a cultural behavior. They're learned, uh, young storks learn them from following older storks. And so when you have an endangered population and population reduction, there's no older storks left to teach the younger storks. So uh, humans have to intervene in this conservation program to uh, sort of regain this cultural behavior uh, that's been lost through captive breeding. Uh, so in Puerto Rican parrots, the cultural behavior that I'm gonna be talking about is uh, called vocal dialects. And uh, dialects, if you're familiar with them in uh, humans, uh, you might also be familiar with them in birds. You know, there's a lot of bird enthusiasts with us. Uh, but here's just a brief explanation of how they work in humans. Here is a, uh, a map of the US. Uh, it's based on a study by the NC State University. 
And uh, they basically uh, took a look at how certain parts of the US had regional dialects. For instance, on the left, you have a uh, pronunciation of uh, um, a sweetened carbonated beverage. And there is this uh, sort of north to south uh, division. And then also on the coast, uh, depending on how, whether or not people pronounce it as soda, pop, or Coke. And then in uh, this other one, uh, you, uh, how, do, how do you refer to a group of people? You, you guys, uh, y'all, and you all. And there's a really nice uh, north to south division of, uh, between y'all and you guys. Uh, and that's what dialects means uh, in humans. Uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, we have a, a very big uh, dialect uh, difference between this, um, this uh, yummy pastry uh, that Puerto Ricans love to eat. And there are, uh, they have different opinions about uh, what is uh, the right name for this pastry. And uh, what you call that pastry is going to depend on what part of the island you're from. Um, so essentially, uh, a dialect, in, at least in terms of birds, means that the birds in a location A are going to reproduce vocalizations uh, that are different from the birds in location B. So uh, bird sounds are going to vary uh, geographically. And uh, dialects are fairly common in birds, uh, at least three groups of birds. We know that they occur in songbirds, in hummingbirds, and in parrots. And the reasons that they occur in these type of birds is because these are the birds that uh, learn their vocal calls. So they, um, th these calls are not innate. So they have to, uh, have to acquire their uh, vocal signals from uh, learning from other uh, conspecifics. And that's why uh, these dialects emerge in these species. Uh, and in parrots, uh, vocal dialects are really well studied in the yellow nape Amazon uh, in Central America. So for instance, this is a study uh, from the Wright Lab in New Mexico State University. They had uh, really clear dialect boundaries uh, at roosting sites where they would go to roosting sites and record the parrots at these different roosting sites. And, and they were able to identify uh, at least four different dialects. And, and uh, the differences are, are pretty impressive when you listen to how different one bird sounds from another. So again, when you look at uh, this map of basically the, the species distribution in Costa Rica, and then as you can see the, the roosting sites uh, separated uh, on a gradient, and then each, uh, each of the, the roosting sites seem to have uh, these different uh, regional dialects. And then uh, birds in between, uh, regional, uh, in between regions sometimes have kind of a hybrid dialect in this species. So same species of parrot, different calls, depending on where they are geographically. So uh, for our study, we wanted to ask uh, the question of, do Puerto Rican Amazons have dialects? Uh, because uh, this is a conservation program. And that was a, a question that we potentially wanted to know uh, the answer to. Uh, because since uh, vocalizations are so important uh, for things like mating and socializing, what if, um, you know, birds in one population or the captive population in the wild population have different dialects and, and maybe that affects their ability uh, to mate with other birds or it can affect their ability to socialize uh, with other birds uh, when you release new birds into, or you move birds between populations. Uh, or what if uh, captive birds and, and wild birds have different dialects and then when you release these birds, they actually have uh, different survival rates because they have different dialects. So there were some potential implications and um, we really wanted to know the, just the answer to that question, which was, you know, do these birds uh, have dialects? So in order to understand why Puerto Rican parrot might have dialects, uh, it's important to understand a little bit of Puerto Rican parrot uh, history. So this was the distribution of the Puerto Rican parrot uh, before colonization. They were found island-wide and they were also found on some of the neighboring islands uh, close to Puerto Rico. Uh, then by the 1940s, the population had been drastically restricted in its range, mainly due to deforestation. Uh, and it was basically restricted only to this uh, mountainous area of what would eventually be called the Aljunque National Forest. Uh, by the 1970s, uh, they decided that 
uh, it would be necessary to start a captive breeding program in order to conserve the species. So uh, in the 1970s, we had two populations, a wild population and a captive population. Then by 1993, um, it became necessary to uh, basically not put your, all your eggs in one basket. So it was decided that the population uh, would be split into uh, separate sites. So we ended up with a second captive breeding uh, facility in the Bajo State Forest, which is where I work. And then by 2006, uh, there were enough birds in captivity that uh, we had the resources to begin releasing some of those birds into the wild. And we founded the second wild population in Rio Bajo. So in order to determine if these birds uh, have dialects, the first step is just to record them, which is what I'm doing uh, very seriously in the left picture and pointing the, uh, <laughs> the directional microphone at the bird. Uh, and then just go out into the field, find some birds, uh, record them, and then obviously do the same thing for birds in captivity. And then uh, compare the calls and see whether or not we could uh, discriminate between populations just based on their vocalizations. Um, so these were the four study populations, the El Junque wild population, which at that time uh, sadly numbered just nine to 11 birds, the captive population in uh, El Junque and the one in Rio Bajo, which both numbered around 200 parrots, and then the wild population in Rio Bajo, which at that time, this is about 2013-14, uh, had uh, 80 to 90 parrots. And um, even though I, I mentioned uh, the possibility of population interactions, uh, birds in El Junque and in the wild in Rio Bajo, they, they would never interact um, naturally because the, the forests are, are too far apart for just natural dispersal to occur, at least in this species. Uh, but we do uh, regularly transfer parrots between the captive populations. And then we also release parrots uh, from the captive populations into the wild. And so that's how you end up with uh, population interactions. Uh, so once we uh, obtained these recordings, we uh, started looking for uh, calls that were common to the different populations. And we were able to identify uh, two of these. They were called, we called them the caw call. And that's what this sounds like. This is our caw call. And then above you'll see the, uh, the spectrogram of that, what that call looks like. And the chi call, and that call, it looks and sounds very different from the cow call. Let me play it for you. So that's the chi call. So these were the two calls that we ended up looking at. Um, and what we found was that the cow call uh, was uh, present in the Rio Bajo wild population, the Rio Bajo captive population, the El Junque captive population. And the chi call was present only in the Rio Bajo captive and the El Junque captive. So the wild birds did not produce the chi calls. Uh, but then the El Junque wild population, as you've noticed, I have not mentioned it. And that's because it didn't produce either caw or chi calls. So uh, immediately that's your first clue that that's a dialect. So uh, the El Junque birds, other than producing these, uh, these caw and chi calls, they produce these vocalizations that sounded uh, drastically different from uh, all the other birds. You would almost think to hear them that they uh, sounded like a, a different species. Here, I'm just gonna play them a little bit. Tanya, that's coming through really quiet. Could you turn up yeah. your volume, try that? I did. Okay. Let me see if I can do anything else. All right, let's try that again. Any better? That's better, yes. Yeah, okay. the calls have been pretty quiet, so I'm glad you were able to do that. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so those are some uh, wild birds in El Junque uh, back at that time. And uh, they mostly made just uh, either two syllable, syllable or one syllable call that were just really uh, different from all the other, uh, both captive and wild populations. So immediately that's our first indication that there was a dialect difference. A full disclosure, we knew this going into the study because you know even though it had not been uh, objectively recorded measure. It, it, it was something that every biologist who had worked with this species was aware of, that the wild birds in El Junque uh, sounded very different from all the other uh, populations. 
Um, so uh, these are the spectrograms from uh, the other uh, populations. And I'm gonna play you a video of uh, what the captive birds in El Junca sound like, just so, so you can get an idea of just how different this is. Yeah, so that's a, a captive bird uh, that's making some uh, caw calls for us in the video. And then uh, on the left, you can see uh, several spectrograms of the caw and she calls. Uh, a and B are birds in El Junque, C and D are birds in uh, Rio Bajo in captivity, and E and F are birds in Rio Bajo in the wild. And then you can see the she calls, uh, G and H and I and J. Uh, G, I'm sorry, G and H are birds in El Junque, and then I and J are birds in uh, Rio Bajo uh, producing she calls. Uh, and so this is just sort of a, a visual example of just how uh, different these vocalizations uh, were between populations. Uh, so we were able to uh, record dialect change, which is probably the question uh, you guys are all asking. It's like, well, can they learn the new dialect? And the answer is yes. So uh, we did record uh, some birds that were uh, started off the El Junque population, uh, transferred to captivity in the Rio Bajo population, and then eventually released into the wild. And they were able to basically just uh, continue to learn uh, the new dialect. So in answer to this question, do Puerto Rican parrots have dialects? And what that was a resounding yes. Um, so let's take a look at those populations a little uh, uh, closer and sort of try to uh, piece apart why these populations might have different dialects. So the El Junque population, uh, like I mentioned, they had no ka or ch and they sounded very different. Uh, uh, and then the El Junque captive population. Uh, so when this population was founded, it was basically uh, founded in the 1970 uh, through the, they, they basically captured very few adults because they were one hard to capture and two, very few of them left. So what they ended up uh, doing to create this captive population was bring in these uh, naive uh, founders, these young birds who really wouldn't have had any opportunity to interact with wild birds. Uh, so they brought them in as uh, eggs or chicks. So, you know, you basically have these birds that are that are coming in and they're blank slate. They haven't really had the opportunity uh, to interact with the birds from the relic population. Uh, to top it off, the very few uh, remaining wild birds at the time, uh, they were in an area that was a little more remote uh, than the, the captive population. So they really didn't have that many uh, opportunities to interact with those few remaining birds. Uh, so instead of being able to model their vocalizations on their own species, what were they learning from since there were so few birds in captivity at the time? Uh, well, back in this time period, the program began to bring in these Espanol and Amazons that were being uh, confiscated from illegal pet trade. And um, they were uh, adults and they were good breeders and uh, they were able to uh, basically foster these Puerto Rican parrot chicks to Espanolans, Amazons. Uh, so it's possible that the original dialect shift happened when you started introducing this variation from this other species that was raising the majority of Puerto Rican parrot chicks back in the 1970s. And uh, just sort of drive the point home, here's what a Puerto Rican parrot call uh, sounds like. And here's an Espanolan Amazon. And here's a she call from a Puerto Rican parrot. And here's one from a Española. So very similar calls. And it's entirely possible uh, that this variation uh, came from this uh, period in time. Uh, so what about the second uh, captive breeding population? Why was there a dialect there? Uh, well, these birds were transferred as adults. So the, the, the chicks born in this population would have had adult learning models. Uh, to learn their vocalizations from. Uh, but because of a phenomenon called cultural drift, where basically the learning process is imperfect and every individual adds variation 
uh, when they are learning a uh, new call uh, over time when populations are isolated, uh, you can end up with uh, calls that sound uh, different from what they uh, what the original founders sounded like. And then uh, in the Rio Bajo wild population, uh, it's possible that a similar uh, situation uh, happened where you basically have uh, adult birds, but because the birds are uh, in the wild and they are uh, preferentially interacting with other wild birds, then you also have opportunity for uh, cultural drift to take place and you end up with uh, more uh, different sounding uh, vocalizations. So uh, possible implications of uh, this type of study, um, you know, we know the dialects exist, but we didn't measure uh, how much do these dialects matter? Um, do uh, our release birds, uh, more have, uh, will they have more trouble adapting once they are released into uh, the wild because they have different dialects? And, uh, you know, what are the potential costs? Like what um, could, could survival be affected? Could the ability to find mates be affected? And the, the truth is we don't know. Um, if we, uh, figuring this out would require a whole other study that might not necessarily be uh, the ideal thing to do with an endangered species. Uh, so basically our recommendations, uh, because we know that these dialects exist, is that to uh, be mindful of them when, uh, whenever we are founding a new population. So for instance, uh, we're getting ready to release another wild population into the uh, Maricao State Forest. Uh, and uh, we think that a, a good course of action would be to expose uh, young parrots to these, uh, these learning models as soon as possible. So assuming that uh, we do get this population started in Maricao, which we really hope we will soon, um, you know, we can presumably expect to find another dialect there, uh, just because those birds are going to be isolated and they're not going to be, uh, you know, they're, they're, once again, you're going to have cultural drift and you're going to have a new dialect formation. So uh, maybe uh, just giving these captive parrots the opportunity to uh, listen to and interact with their wild counterparts uh, would be beneficial in, in helping them to acquire uh, these new dialects in the future. Okay, and I'm out of time. So thank you very much. And here are uh, ways to contact me or keep track of the uh, project in the future if you so wish. All right, that's it, Lisa. All right, thank you so much, Tanya. That was so <laughs> interesting. I'm sure there will be some questions for you at the end. So um, don't disappear, stay with us. And um, we now have part two of our webinar today. Um, we're pleased to have with us um, Dr. Mark Hume. Mark is originally from the UK. He's a lecturer um, right now in zoology at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus in Trinidad. He has been working for over 20 years on ecology, conservation, science, and ornithology, concentrating on human impacts on habitats and biodiversity, wildlife survey techniques, and bird conservation. He um, wants you to know that he first visited the Caribbean traveling to Jamaica at age one, but he sadly does not remember that. Um, since then, he's worked for several years in Africa, returned to the Caribbean to study the Montserrat Oriole post-volcanic eruption, completed a PhD at the University of St. Andrews in the UK, worked for many years for um, major environmental NGOs, and he now concentrates on research and education in Trinidad and Tobago. So welcome, Mark. He's been, he'll be talking to us about the Poway, the endangered Trinidad piping guan, and his work on um, bioacoustics with this endangered species. Welcome, Mark. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, okay, so I'm sharing my screen. I'm hoping that you're seeing title page now. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, listening out for the critically endangered Powy, um, which is the local name for the Trinidad piping one. And a lot of these photos, uh, such as this one, where um, I, um, if anyone follows me on Twitter, they'll know I take terrible photos of birds. Uh, these, most of these photos are taken by a friend of mine. Uh, from Mexico visited Trinidad a couple of years ago. So I take uh, no credit for most of them. Okay, so um, 
the PAWI, and I'll talk, call it the PAWI from now on, is uh, the only endemic bird species on the island of Trinidad. So the Trinidad mock moth is also endemic to Trinidad and Tobago, but is also found in um, large numbers on Tobago. The PAWI is only on Trinidad. It's one of five critically endangered crassids. Um, it was previously hunted. I put a question mark there because um, it may still be hunted from time to time. Um, and it, uh, habitat degradation is also a big threat to this bird um, in its uh, forested habitat, uh, such as from this uh, quarry you can see in the bottom left. So there are large arboreal social crassids. So crassids of um, uh, wands, uh, chachalacas, chacha uh, curacaos, uh, only found um, in the uh, in the New World in uh, uh, South America and the Caribbean and Central America. Um, uh, that it, they are arboreal, as in they uh, spend most of their time in trees, um, but their their young spend life start life on the ground. You can see bottom left here is a, a camera trap set up by a colleague, uh, Lee Ross Stant at the University of the West Indies uh, to look for uh, mammals found the parry on the ground. You can't really see it, but if you zoom in a little bit here, you can see a powy chick, uh, which is how they start life on the ground before moving into the trees. Um, they're the largest uh, avian frugivore in Trinidad and over 70 food plant species have been identified. So they're likely to be very important in terms of uh, seed dispersal on the island. Um, and they can be quite social, um, and up to 26 have been seen at one time, um, and that was quite fairly recently that's been reported. So this bird um, species has been known about for quite a long time, at least in terms of um, uh, Western knowledge. So this picture on the left was from this publication, 1766, which appears to be a Trinidad, Trinidad piping one. Um, Leo Taud. Uh, in the mid 19th century, published uh, birds of the island of Trinidad and included um, the Trinidad piping one. And here on the right uh, is a note from uh, 18, uh, publication 1894 on the uh, Pipile Pipile or the Powie um, by Frank Chapman. And he writes, I observed only one individual, an adult male with blue throat and cheeks. Uh, shot from a tree in the forest three miles from the rest house. The flesh of this species is deservedly esteemed, and through the persecution of hunters, it is rapidly becoming a rare bird. So even, even over, well over 100 years ago, um, uh, some observers were worried about the, um, the status uh, of this bird. Uh, they're, they're big like turkeys, they have a lot of meat on them. Although I've also heard that the meat is a bit tough, um, and hunters used to hunt them to eat themselves rather than sell them because uh, the meat didn't get uh, to attract very much money compared with um, things like agoutis that they were um, uh, they were mainly hunting for. So this is the current the current distribution of the uh, powy at the top in red, the probable remaining core range. And some of these dots are some areas that have been seen in in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, the blue ellipses are um, areas the forest uh, where Powie used to occur, uh, but it may be extirpated and there haven't been um, uh, very uh, firm sighting, report sightings uh, in recent years. Okay, so, you know, you can see just in terms of um, uh, range contraction, uh, the population has really suffered um, at least over the last hundred or more years. There has been a, a, estimates, a population estimate uh, conducted. So um, this was a uh, field work that was conducted uh, 20 years ago. Uh, point counts, um, they worked very hard on this uh, uh, survey, but they only got three dissections of Powie and they estimated 77 to 231 individuals, which isn't very many, okay? but it wasn't a, um, a very effective survey and a, a subsequent project concluded that point counts are not a practical option in this situation. So for those of us who want to actually find out the current state of the PAWI, we want to try and find alternative methods. Okay, and, um, 
The power has now been uh, designated as critically endangered by the IUCN. Um, and I want to give this a go. So if any of you have uh, smartphones handy, um, I want to try this uh, polling app. All you need to do is uh, in your smartphone browser, go to www.menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I.com. And when you do that, it should show a um, option to add a code. And once you're there, uh, the code I want you to add is 36541146. Okay, so hopefully you can see that um, on your screens now. I'll give you a little bit of time to organize yourselves to do that. I'll have a couple of questions throughout the talk. Um, can do through your smart your smartphones by this website. That's three six five four one one four six, and it's www.menti.com. Now I'll see if any of you are joining. There you go. Yeah, you can add to your names or just give yeah, use the uh, uh, automatic names that the website gives yourself, and it gives you an exciting. Uh, Avatar as well. There you go, I can see a few more of you coming in. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, once I press enter, it's gonna put a question up. Um, do, you, uh, do you think the Poway population is increasing or decreasing? And then you'll have about 20 seconds to answer. Okay, and it'll just be a case of clicking either uh, increase or decrease on your um, smartphone. Okay, so I'll press enter now. And the faster you answer, the more points you get. So you can look at your phone now. Five seconds to answer. Everyone has voted. Wow, that's amazing. So there we have. An exact, the exact same number of people said the Parry were increasing and said they were decreasing. And actually, those who said the Parry population was increasing are correct, uh, which is excellent news. Okay, so we'll see also if we can go. Okay, and it should show a leaderboard now, depending on who answered fastest. So Sinead is leading. Well done. Okay, we'll come back to that. So yes, yeah, so previously the IACN website uh, showed the uh, Poway numbers decreasing. You have this estimate based on that original uh, population estimates. Uh, here they say 50 to, about 50 to 250 individuals. But recently, anecdotal reports, so anecdotal only rather than based on firm data, have indicated the population trend may well be increasing and they've kind of upped the estimates of number of individuals. But to be honest, this is all anecdotal and we actually still have no idea really how many individuals are present. So about 10 years ago, they published a species recovery strategy for the Poway. Um, and they actually stated here, there is only anecdotal information on its distribution and no reliable population estimate. And this still is the case. And they mentioned in action 1.1 uh, requirements to conduct a distribution and population survey through all known and potential existing habitats for the species. Um, so this is what I've kind of tried to start the ball rolling on effectively. So although um, point counts aren't a very, isn't a very good uh, way to uh, monitor parry because uh, um, although they're big birds they can be quite difficult to uh, see in the trees and also uh, their vocal and wing drumming um, activity is often very early in the morning usually pre-dawn so when it's dark so it's very challenging to get to these remote places that they occur uh, pre-dawn to do point counts that are going to effectively assess population um, and they do have these but they do have these distinctive 
vocalizations or piping calls, and also um, these non-vocal uh, audio cues, uh, wing drums. So just like this bird in the middle, flying from tree to tree, uh, flapping their wings and creating this distinctive sound. And I'm gonna try playing this for you now. It's, it's gonna be piping and then the wing drum as seen in this spectrogram. Oops, no. One. Piping is this rising call and the wing drum this quite low and loud um, flapping noise. Chris, I hope you agree these very distinctive sounds. And I, not only do I take terrible photos of pictures of uh, photos of animals but I also take bad videos so here's a powie about 20 meters away from me piping it's really quiet for such a large bird luckily we have the wing drums which are quite loud as um uh, good cues Okay, so this makes us think, could acoustic recorders help? Just like Tanya was talking about using uh, sounds uh, for monitoring. So for example, I, I've been using these um, Wildlife Acoustics SM4 recorders uh, set out in the field. Uh, you just need to uh, deploy them and then, re and then uh, retrieve them. There's uh, not as much labor required as for point counts, but we need to know, do they effectively detect POWI? What's the detection distance, or how far away how you have to be for them to detect, so we can uh, uh, come up with a decent uh, survey design? Um, and can these help us understand how POWI activity varies spatially, seasonally, and with human disturbance in Trinidad? So I've done these pilot studies uh, uh, based around um, student projects. Uh, since 2019, so with Alicia Coolen uh, from an MSc project, then Janella as an undergraduate project, and Ishang uh, Kaliakaran at the moment doing his MSc, and he's actually giving his defense presentation tomorrow. Um, and we set out recorder arrays of different parts of Trinidad, uh, depending on what resources we had available at the time. Um, and I've also tried to uh, we've also tried to incorporate automated detection rather than going through having to go through hundreds and hundreds of hours of recordings. Uh, this cluster analysis, uh, wildlife acoustics uh, Kaleidoscope Pro software can do cluster analyses um, uh, to recognize patterns and separate out POWI from non POWI sounds. We've actually got good results from these the wing drums. Um, but there are, there's still, it's still not perfect, but it does seem to reduce manual labor significantly. Okay, and I was going to do a second uh, question on Mentimeter. Which of, the, of these are PAWI sounds? Have you been concentrating? If you go back to your smartphones, go to menti.com. Um, hopefully you've already entered, it's the same, uh, it's the same code. And then answer the question, which of these spectrograms do you think are PAWI? Okay, and I will we go to the next question here. Okay, so is it A or B? A and B, B and D, or C and D? So this should give you an idea as to kind of how difficult it can sometimes be to, um, uh, even with the help of uh, spectrograms to pick out the correct uh, vocalizations and sounds that the species you're interested in. Okay, 10 seconds left. Okay. 
Okay, and time's up. All right, so only two of you got the correct answer, which was B and D. Let's see who actually won. Okay, so the um, snappily named 36541146 one. Congratulations to them. Okay, so actually A is a little tinamou, B is a Pawi wing drum, C is a uh, woodpecker drumming, and D is a um, Pawi piping call. So the recorders did detect Pawi at nearly all deployments and at nearly all sites. You can see from the pictures here that there's a variety of different levels of disturbance that Pawi might be able to tolerate. Okay, and we did some experiments to see whether or not how what the detection distance might be for the recorders. And uh, Alicia um, determined that there was at least a hundred meter potential detection radius in forest, both from playback uh, experiments and paired detections in, um, in the fields at, with um, actual Powie wing drums. Uh, so you can say that um, maybe 200 meters apart, you, you have a good chance of uh, recording a Powie halfway between. And we also found that um, there was a seasonal variation, uh, a real drop off uh, between kind of um, March, April, May, June, and then a drop off, a real drop off in July, suggesting uh, that the dry, dry season is a much better time to survey the Parry because of the um, vocal activity. And we've also found that they can be quite tolerant or very tolerant to human disturbance. Um, here you had, we had. Uh, uh, recorders right by a road um, and in the um, adjacent primary forest and we actually got a lot more activity by the road which is good news in a way in that they can tolerate a certain amount of human disturbance. We actually think that hunting rather than habitat um, destruction may have been the most recent driver of uh, Poway uh, population uh, reduction. So 2021 data, um, Ishan has some results, but he's presenting tomorrow. So I'm not going to um, steal his thunder with his uh, MSC presentation, but we do still have recorders out testing different uh, recorder models. We've uh, recorded over a thousand Powie recordings just this year. Um, and we're getting a, a much better idea on seasonality and improved autom automation. Uh, but we're uh, observing quite a lot of clearing in the areas we're working, working in. This may or may not be a big problem for the Powy. It may be in the long run. So in conclusion, uh, these do seem to be effect an effective way to uh, survey a detection distance up to at least 100 meters. Uh, the dry season is best for this type of monitoring. Powy seem to be quite disturbance tolerant, tolerant and using this perhaps in a combination of point counts and up to updated distribution data and maybe population estimates as well within reach. So we mentioned that Powy were increasing. I think this is probably due to um, the, this Pride in the Powy project that uh, was rolled out about 10 years ago and may well have increased awareness and reduced hunting in, uh, resulting in these anecdotal observations of increased distribution recently. So I think a really good example of a kind of community conservation project potentially uh, uh, giving good results. So in the future, um, I'd like to try and roll out a full survey of habitat across Trinidad, target surveys for abundance. Um, I'm looking in, into collaborating with government agencies for this and also with um, other departments in UE. So for example, improving automated detection uh, physics departments in UE Mona, Jamaica. Um, I'd like to uh, start up community uh, conservation, community engagement again, and update the species re recovery strategy. And also think about how to repopulate the, the um, uh, populations in central and southern Trinidad, um, just as uh, Tanya um, has been doing uh, with the Puerto, Re Puerto Rican Amazon. Um, but I don't know if they have, uh, uh, if, if there is such a thing as a uh, uh, wing drum dialect, I doubt it somehow. Okay, so thanks very much everyone who's helped, um, particularly UE and Wildlife Acoustics who provided funding.
and all the students that are working, are working with me um, on this work. Uh, and thanks to Alex for these nice illustrations. And thank you all for listening as well. All right. Thank you so much, Mark. That was fantastic. Uh, we do have a few questions. Um, so let's um, call the panelists back up. You're all here. That's great. And um, I'll pose them to you guys one at a time. Um, so Tara's asking, it was fairly early in your webinar, Tanya. She asked, um, so are you saying that an endangered bird raised in captivity rather than in the wild will have altered behaviors? Uh, yes, there's a lot of evidence of uh, how captive breeding changes all sorts of behaviors. Just the, the whooping cranes are a really good example of that. Just how, especially with these behaviors that you, you learn, you need to interact with other wild birds and, and not having uh, not having the, just that experience in, that, in, in the wild, not to mention uh, just, just all the genetic effects that you know, can happen with reduced populations. But just uh, the captive environment, no matter how good we are, we can never mimic uh, the wild environment. And so for, for these parrots, that they, they rely a lot on uh, conspecific learning in particular with uh, vocalizations, uh, then yeah, so you, you get a lot of uh, differences between wild and captive birds. Right, so the parrot guardians, the people that are doing the raising, they're doing their best to minimize kind of human contact. I know in other species they use puppets and yeah. you know, things so like things like that. We don't do, uh, at least in our, in our project in Tiobajo, we just, uh, we do basically zero hand rearing. It's all, it's mostly parent reared, except in very extreme circumstances. Uh, like for instance, right now we're at the end of a breeding season and, and, and the pair, there's one pair in Pio that said like, oh, I want to lay two more eggs. And, um, you know, and then abandons the nest. So th th there might not be um, any anyone to raise those last two ticks and we might end up having to hand rear those. But you know, out of 50 chicks, if you just end up having to hand rear two, that's you know that's still pretty good. But we do um, minimize that type of contact and uh, always prefer to have parent rear chicks, especially because they are going to be used for release. And if we ever do end up having to hand rear chicks, then they um, they're future captive breeders. They're not candidates for release into the wild. Excellent. Yeah, just really fascinating. All these things that you know <laughs> about. And I know many years ago it took a while for. For scientists to learn, you know, about these yeah. these effects and, and their impacts on trying to release birds back into the wild and so forth. Um, uh, Tara also is asking, what is the current pair population size? If you could review that for us. So there is around uh, there are around five hundred uh, or so in captivity, uh, separated between the different captive populations in the wild in Rio Bajo. Our current our last population estimate was around 140 to 150 wild birds, but that was pre-breeding season because we have just fled 60 chicks in the wild this breeding season. It's a huge record for us. So that's 60 new chicks uh, that are gonna join their, their wild counterpart. So we think are really hoping that our next population count gets us fairly close to 200, which would be the largest uh, wild population of Puerto Rican uh, parrots in the history of this conservation program. We're very excited about that. Um, unfortunately, in El Junque, uh, they have suffered really devastating uh, setback with Hurricane Maria, where basically that wild population, um, they, they, they pretty much lost that entire population during that storm. And they have been uh, struggling um, to, to sort of uh, get back uh, to releasing birds into the wild. And, and they've had some early successes, but they're, they're in very early stages of, of releasing birds in El Junque now. And then uh, we're planning to release a new population to the Maricao State Forest, hopefully uh, at the beginning of uh, next year. So we'll see how that goes. All right, that's really exciting. Good news. Okay, uh, another question for Tanya. Are the introduced populations of Puerto Rican parrots self-sustaining or do they need to be supplemented through captive prop propagation? That is such a great question. Um, so I don't have a very clear cut answer for that because you really would need, uh, and, we're, and we're working on, uh, uh, with help of the Lincoln Park Zoo, we're working on population viability analysis. And that's one of the questions that we've really posed, sort of like, okay, you know, we know that we inject uh, X number of birds 
into the wild each year through releases and uh, through just a, a birds that just naturally fledge in the wild because we, we do have more and more nests each year and the population seems to be growing steadily each year. Uh, but we don't know if we're at a stage where we could uh, dial back those efforts and uh, continue to see uh, sustained population growth or population stability. So, I mean, right now, um, the answer is, yeah, you know, this is very, all the wild populations are very intensively managed. Um, and we don't know, we're not yet at a point where we can comfortably scale back those efforts uh, and see the, these populations uh, continue to, to thrive. But we are seeing a lot of really uh, positive uh, outcomes of this conservation program. And, and uh, you know, in my eyes, it's, it's definitely one of the conservation success stories of the Caribbean. Definitely. All right, that's good news, thanks. Uh, all right, and a question for Mark. Are there any Poway captive breeding programs in Trinidad and Tobago? Uh, no, there aren't. Um, there's, talk, there's talk, has been talk of it for a number of years, uh, captive breeding, because that is likely the only way that they're going to be replaced in central and southern Trinidad. Um, you know, once we're sure, once um, kind of stakeholders are sure that uh, ed the education programs are have been sufficient to uh, make sure that, that hunters will not target them. Um, but yeah, it's a very big, it would be a very big undertaking. And ideally you'd have it undertaken within Trinidad. So a local program, you know, maybe, you know, certainly with international collaboration um, but in a local uh, a local site. So where that local site would be is one question. Where the money would come from is another question. Where the expertise would come from for the kind of um, you know, aviculture and, and raising the, the birds successfully um, and successfully introducing them into the wild once it comes to that. Um, so it's, it's a really big undertaking, but yes, it is likely the only way that, that that's the distribution is going to extend beyond the northern range at the moment, unless they surprise us and either turn up um, in um, sustainable numbers in the south or uh, move to, from the northern range across the kind of urbanized east-west corridor in Trinidad. Um, but that seems fairly unlikely. So I think it's, that will have to happen at some point if um, if we're serious about extending the range into historical areas. Yeah, they're, they're not very good flyers, are they? Do they fly very far? They don't fly very far, no. So, you know, the, the chances of them flying over the town of Arima into the central range are quite limited, are quite small, I'd say. Yep. Okay. All right, super. Uh, let's see, another question from Mark. Um, how long can the acoustic monitoring devices be left in the field and how precisely can they estimate distances? So I haven't tried to estimate distances. There are ways of doing that. It would take a bit more work um, and kind of exper field experimentation. I mean, people have attempted that with other um, bird species with, with kind of varying success. Uh, so, you know, potentially you could maybe do distance sampling once you've got distance estimations to get population estimation to get population rather than just occupancy or um, presence absence data. Um, so that's a possibility, but again, it would take a it would take quite a, a lot of work to um, to get that working effectively. Um, in terms of how long they can stay out for, they the battery life is really good. Um, I found recently it's actually been um, memory capacity that's limited me in terms of how long um, I can leave them out for. And I keep having to consider buying bigger and bigger SD cards to, um, to store all the data because it, um, this uh, requires a lot of data storage. These, uh, you know, lossless uh, audio files take up a lot of memory. Um, but you can, you can, I schedule, I schedule my recording so that they're um, at the peak activity time, which is, we think is around about kind of, you know, somewhere between four in the morning and seven in the morning. 
So you can limit the amounts of recording ET that way, but they don't necessarily call or certainly wing drum very often. So, you know, I like to have a, a kind of continuous recording for a certain, a particular period of time. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of projects do a kind of one, one minutes on, nine minutes off schedule. And I think, you know, you're, you're risking um, missing a lot of the focal activity that way. Yeah. But they, you know, you, they'll probably stay, the, the batteries will probably last, say, three months or so in the field, at least. Excellent. And what is the function of the wing drumming? Is that a territorial display or portrait, do you know? No one actually knows for sure. There's a lot we don't know about this species, um, particularly in terms of reproductive biology. So it's likely to be due to um, related to reproduction, and they do seem to nest around about kind of January, February, March time at the times when, you know, chicks have definitely been seen in the field before. Um, and But, you know, there aren't very many reports of chicks, but that tends to be the time of year. And it also tends to be the time when piping and wing drumming is at its, um, its peak. Okay. Great. Uh, another question for Mark. Is the home range of the Poway known? And is that a consideration in terms of the number of recorded recorders needed for monitoring? It's not known. Again, people attempted to um, catch and tag them to try and estimate their home ranges and foraging ranges, etc. But they did not managed to do that. So we don't know their home ranges. It may be a bit more complicated as well, depending on how social they actually are, um, uh, which is another complication when trying to estimate population. If you have kind of um, clusters of, of Poway in certain areas and that um, makes it more difficult to estimate numbers both from you know face-to-face -face surveys and also from monitor, uh, audio surveys um, but if we you know if we can get a better better handle on their um, foraging ranges home ranges then we may be able to um, it may make it easier for us to estimate the density of the birds within a known distribution their known distribution so again this you know this is all stuff that, that people have tried and sometimes failed before but um again it's you know getting guessing funding for all this work is is the issue really rather than kind of knowing what work it is we need to do yeah all right okay and i think you kind of touched on this but there was a question is there any way in the near future of having better statistics on the poway population so Yes, there is. You know, we need to collect more data in more parts of the forest across, certainly across the northern range. Um, and uh, as I said, I think, you know, it might be good to try and combine, although, you know, point counts are challenging, maybe combine face to face um, or in person surveys with audio surveys. Um, maybe do audio surveying across across the entire range and then sample uh, at random sites where you do get have um, uh, Poway, uh, uh, Poway occupancy. Um, yeah, but it's, you know, that it's, it's, uh, yeah, that's how, we, that's how we'll do it rather than necessarily, you know, just the kind of anecdotal data collection that's, that's been going on for the last 20 years. All right, well, we'll look forward to a webinar in the future from you giving us an estimate of the population density. Yeah, well, I hope so. Yeah, maybe the next year or two. Uh, all right, a question for Tanya. Um, do you think that noise pollution could affect the mating of the Puerto Rican parrot? Um, possibly, but the populations are in such remote areas that that's not really an issue right now because right now the populations are just isolated to these forest reserves that there's there's really just no people around them. Um, there are Puerto Ricans uh, just, uh, tend to confuse the Puerto Rican parrot with a bunch of these uh, urban parrots. They're uh, non-native um, uh, species like monk parakeets and canary wing parakeets. And, and those are very common in, in urban areas. So sometimes uh, I get people asking me about those types of parrots, but those are just because that's not the Puerto Rican parrot. The, the Puerto Rican parrot uh, range right now is limited to the, the populations that I described in, in the presentation. 
Excellent. All right. And uh, another question for both of you, actually. How does climate change impact the Puerto Rican parrot populations and the Poway? So maybe go ahead, Tanya. Yeah, so um, I don't have an answer for that because nobody has studied it. I, I have a lot of questions that, uh, that you know, you could pose and, and try to get the answers to. I think one of probably the, the biggest impacts is hurricanes, is, you know, what is climate change going to do to the, the frequency of hurricanes and the intensity of hurricanes? Are they predicted to be uh, more intense and more frequent. And, you know, if that continues to be an issue, then that's definitely uh, going to have a huge impact on uh, species recovery, because we've already seen what uh, the effects of a hurricane, a really strong hurricane in 2017, Hurricane Maria, absolutely decimated uh, the wild population. So the, the Aljunca population, the wild Aljunca population uh, was basically destroyed and the Rio Baja population was almost cut in half. So I think that's one of the, the biggest uh, potential consequences of climate change. Other things that would be interesting to look into is just sort of how uh, local weather patterns uh, continue to change, whether we get more rain, earlier rain, uh, and that could affect fruiting phenology, like what, uh, what fruits, uh, what trees come into fruit and um, whether or not they're coming into fruit at the same time that they've always been. Um, for uh, for the, uh, the chicks to uh, take advantage of them when uh, when they they come into fruit or um, and also uh, temperature increases and how that could potentially affect nest nest success uh, because nests can be uh, pretty hot so um, what happens uh, when the temperature increases what's going to happen to uh, the eggs and the chicks that are inside uh, the nest and how is that going to affect survival in the long term. And th those are just a bunch of questions that we could ask and we really have no idea yet, but you know, it's, it's a good study <laughs> if somebody's looking for a, a master's or PhD project and uh, we really have just more questions and answers. Yeah, uh, climate change is gonna have and already has had and it will have so many impacts. You know, some we might be able to predict, others I'm sure will be unpredictable. But like you said, certainly the more frequent and severe hurricanes is a factor. I know on some Caribbean islands, there's going to be increased drying, which could lead to more forest fires and, and you know, just changes in, in the trees, like you say, the fruiting time and availability of fruits, things like that. So, so lots, lots to worry about and to study for sure. All right, thank you for that. Um, all right question for Mark. It was mentioned that collaboration is done with the physics departments in Mona. Can more elaboration be made on that, the linking with the two departments? Um, so this is a collaboration between kind of me at Department of Life Sciences at UE St. Augustine in Trinidad, also the computing department at St. Augustine, um, and uh, physics department in Mona, who are, um, uh, so got um, Fedra Bahamid at U.E. St. Augustine um, kind of specializes on uh, analyzing, um, normally, normally she works on kind of human vocal activity and analyzing vocal act human vocal activity. Um, and then we've collaborated with, um, we're hope hoping to get a collaboration with um, Andre Coy, Coy, I think it is in um, U.E. Mona. Um, he's got a lot of my data to have a look at um, ways of uh, using uh, kind of machine learning or artificial intelligence um, to try and improve the automated detect uh, identification of specifically of powy sounds. It's very it's a very complicated process um, or you know it, it's a very it's often a very inconsistent process um, this automated detection so you know it, lots of people all over the world trying to improve the results of automated bird sound detection and it's often you're likely to get better results by, by concentrating on, on um, a particular species and particular sounds by particular species rather than uh, looking at you know the hundreds and thousands of sounds you know all the all the different bird species in the forest in Trinidad could be making at any one time. Um, so yes, that's very early stages, but I'm hoping you know, we might get some um, good 
results that will save us some time in the lab or at least in the office with uh, data processing um, in the future. All right, sounds good. Yeah, the field seems like it's advancing very quickly, which is exciting. Yeah, I suppose there's another question. If, if the parry loses habitat, will it keep migrating to keep to find new areas to live or die? And yes, that's potentially that could be part of the reason why we're observing increased just you know of extent extended distribution of the parry at the moment. You know, so we don't know if these parry moving into areas that haven't been seen in for several years may just be because you know, the disturbance within in the um, northern range has reached a point at which they're kind of moving away from areas that have been over dis you know disturbed more than than they're able to cope with. I saw Faraz in the comments pointed out that one of the sites I worked at, Mont Bleu, has got a lot, there's a lot of disturbance and that just seems to be getting worse, for example. So that will be happening in various various parts. Um, so I think I think the population probably is increasing and this distribution increase is a genuine increase in distribution, but there could be some um, uh, kind of... Uh, uh, disruption or disturbance factors involved in that as well, which is why we need we you know you know we need we need this population data as soon as possible, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it is alarming to hear about the loss of habitat too, and what that could be doing as far as changing the distribution and so forth. Um, another question: Are there vigorous efforts to try to help with the conservation of the Powie? And I know you talked a little bit about education awareness and that you think that that's helped. So you're going to be doing more. Yeah, I mean, there's, there aren't any uh, current efforts. I mean, I guess other than, um, you know, kind of certain individuals are interested in trying to find out more about the Powie and, um, you know, I'm trying to get, uh, some of us are trying to get money from the government at the moment to get, you um, uh, extend, you know, more extensive research and also education programs up and running, but those aren't, those are all um, uh, hopeful at the moment rather than ongoing, other than kind of, you know, my fairly limited field work that me and my students are doing at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very limited at the moment, but I think, you know, education, you can't just do education once and then and you know, forget about it. It has to, you know, you have to keep going and keep um, keep putting your points across. Yeah, doing some kind of a so, pride campaign yeah. would be really valuable. Yeah, yeah, that takes a lot of effort. Um, yeah, given that it's a critically endangered species, um, I hope you can find more funding. To... Yeah, I mean, they might if if the if the popula if they decide the population increase in. Uh, um, continues for another couple of years, they'll probably downgrade it to endangered, which is good for the Powie, but, um, you know, might make it slightly more difficult to get funding, you know, but I'd rather, I'd rather the Powie is increasing than, uh, than I can get funding. Um, but, you know, the thing is, you know, as I say, it's, it's, these, this recent, these recent trends are really only based on anecdotal data, so I really want some, um, yeah. uh, you know, rigorous, um, scientific surveys and monitoring uh, rolled out. Yeah, and these these audio audio recorders could potentially be a way of um, ensuring kind of medium to long term monitoring um, if there's if there's funding to maintain the the equipment. Yeah, and I hope they won't change the status until you have some solid data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, they yeah they have a five year rule, so. Um, uh, they've decided it started increasing in 2018, so by 2023 they'll downgrade us unless they have they hear otherwise. All right. Okay. Uh, another question for Tanya: um, How complex is the Puerto Rican parrot um, repertoire? I would imagine that missing vocal elements might be more or less consequential depending on the vocabulary size of a species. Yeah. So <laughs> that's another great question. Um, so the short answer is it's huge. Uh, it's an enormous <laughs> repertoire. I did not set out uh, to quantify it and quantifying it is just sort of beyond uh, possibly my skills. It's, it's 
it's an enormous effort and it's a very large uh, repertoire. It's, it's a lot of uh, variation, especially when you're looking at uh, four different populations. So, you know, th that was considerable amount of work. Um, uh, as far as uh, missing elements, it's so what we're what we're looking at when you when you think about um, the differences in in in, uh, in repertoire between the the relict wild population in a June game and the first captive population, it was more more than missing elements. I would say it was just an entire repertoire replacement. Um, so it, rather than saying like, okay, there's these particular calls that are just not present in one population and they are in another, it, it just the original, the difference between the relic pop, population and all the other uh, populations was just an absolute replacement of the, the entire repertoire. Um, and in terms of, you know, how well they would do um, with this changed repertoire, I mean, you only need to look at uh, the example of the wild population in Triobajo that had this entirely... Uh, different repertoire from the original wild population and uh, see how well they're doing. Uh, so the important thing is that the, the calls, even though they are different, uh, they are functional. So uh, presumably there were uh, takeoff calls and, and uh, contact calls and mating calls and, and you know, just uh, different uh, call elements with different uh, functions. Um, they seem to be uh, very specific to the population. So either way, the wild population in Tiobajo already uh, seems to have developed its own versions of those calls. Uh, so they, they seem to be getting along uh, really well <laughs> without them, or they have, you know, at this point, they've already innovated and, and come up with uh, their own versions. That's great news. They still communicate, even though they have these yes. dialects. Take home message. <laughs> uh, all right, well, um, this has been a fantastic session. I just want to say thank you so much to Tanya and Mark for these really fascinating webinars. Uh, they will be available for viewing on Zoom and we'll also get them up on our uh, YouTube channel. So check them out there. So thank you to everybody for joining us today and for your excellent questions. And um, we hope to see you back here um, one week from today for the last webinar in our series on uh, birds in uh, Abaco, Bahamas after Hurricane Dorian. That's gonna be a really interesting talk as well. So everybody have a great evening and um, we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.